representative of the cancer support community. And then also just to kind of <clears throat> And uh, can you hear that? Yes. Yeah. So I'm a medical oncologist, and so uh, basically what we do is a few things. We uh, take care of patients when uh, it involves any kind of medication. Uh, that's uh, our role. And we also do counseling in terms of helping people uh, decide what other maybe non-medical therapies that they might need. And we kind of uh, act as the quarterbacks or the coordination of care, particularly when someone's going to need multiple modalities of care. Uh, so that's really what uh, a medical oncologist does. Um, I, uh, I'm a general medical oncologist, so I take care of all uh, different kinds of cancers, but I do have a particular interest in prostate cancer. Probably about a third or so of uh, the people I see do have prostate cancer. So uh, even though I don't do it full time, it is a, a special interest uh, of mine. Uh, so uh, I work at uh, the Christ Hospital. Um, obviously, there's several hospital systems, and that happens to be the one that, that I uh, sit at. And um, among uh, other hats that I wear, that is. Uh, I uh, put together, you may or not be aware of this, there's a uh, multidisciplinary uh, prostate uh, collaborative uh, that I put together a few years ago in collaboration with the urologist there and the, the radiation oncologist there. So we have a program where people can come for second opinions and they see all the specialties uh, at one sitting, which is kind of a unique thing instead of having to go from office to office. So uh, that's just one of the few things that uh, uh, we've done there that uh, I've been <clears throat> excited to be involved in. So I've talked here before, it's been a little while since I talked here, and I think the first couple times I came here, um, I thought uh, I was going to meet a group that didn't know anything about prostate cancer, and I kind of started with some real basics, and then from the questions that immediately came, it became apparent that you guys are extremely knowledgeable. Uh, and you guys know a ton of stuff about prostate cancer already. So in trying to decide what I would do tonight, what I decided to do was at least to start, and we can go anywhere you want, uh, is start by talking about some of the newest things that uh, came up at meetings or in publications uh, during the year of 2015. Uh, and some of this you guys may know some of it already, and some of it you may not. Uh, uh, but if you also want to talk about other things, I'm fine to do that too. Uh, my strength really is medication therapy for prostate cancer. Um, but uh, there are, were some important things uh, in 2015 that don't involve medications. Um, it, so there, there's a few different things I can talk about. and I guess some of it will be up to you. Uh, some of the areas that uh, there are new stuff going on is one is some new data with uh, active surveillance, so I can talk about some of that. Um, I can talk about um, an old drug that we use all the time in very advanced prostate cancer, taxotere, and how it's, it's a chemotherapy that's now being used much earlier on in <coughs> prostate cancer based on some 2015 data. Um, there's a, a new drug that just got accelerated approval by the FDA uh, called, uh, excuse me, uh, oh, 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 trying to pronounce it right. The laparid, which uh, is uh, a very exciting drug, I can talk about that. Um, there's some new data with statins in prostate cancer, uh, I can talk about that. Um, and then there's also some new data about uh, hormone therapy and its effect on cognition and possibly increasing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that's another area um, where there's a lot of recent publications. So I don't know if anyone has a preference or I can just start with one of those topics. Anyone have a burning desire to hear one over the other? I'm interested in active surveillance. Active surveillance, okay. Um, I do have a couple cheat sheets here because I haven't memorized all of the data. Um, but anyway, in 2015, um, well, let me just preface a little bit. Active surveillance um, is patients who have very early prostate cancer. What we know is that a lot of these people will do very well over many, many years and 
will have very little progression of their cancer, whereas some other people will have progression um, and need therapy. And uh, so active surveillance came out of this observation that there's a subset of patients who really you can watch them for a decade or longer and really their disease never becomes clinically significant or, or bothers them. Uh, and so it's a way to watch people uh, carefully um, and only intervene if there seems to be a reason to intervene. But there's not a lot of data in terms of really long-term uh, outcomes for that. Uh, and so there's been a lot of trepidation as, you know, is active surveillance really something I should do? Um, shouldn't I get treated right away? I mean, I, I have cancer. I mean, why would I just not do anything? Uh, and so, uh, um, are you guys familiar with um, how we divide people into what's called very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, high risk? You guys are all familiar with that? Okay. So, active surveillance has really been something that's pretty much restricted to people who are very low risk or low risk disease. Essentially, it's people with Gleason 6 or less, uh, PSA is 10 or less, uh, and only a relatively small amount of cancer in their prostate. So the two big studies that came back out in 2015, the first was a study out of Toronto, and it was about 900 and some patients, I think it's 980 patients, and about 75% uh, of them were low risk disease, and about 25% of them were intermediate risk disease, but the intermediate risk patients were still had a PSA less than 15, and they had to be, I think, over the age of 70 or 75. Everyone else was a low risk disease. And uh, so they followed these people for up to 15 years uh, with active surveillance. Uh, and treatment was recommended if the Gleason score went up, uh, if there's any clinical progression of the disease, or if the PSA doubling time became less than three years. So those were really their criteria where they said, you know, you, you need to do something, stop the active surveillance and get definitive therapy. Uh, and what they saw was that, um, got, again, chief here, it was um, at five years, about 75% of people still were under active surveillance. After 10 years, it was 65%, and after 15 years, still 55% of men were still just being followed. So really after 15 years, still a little bit more than half the people did not require any therapy, they were just being watched. Uh, the more important thing is, well, what, you know, what was the long-term outcome of these patients? Uh, and it turns out uh, in this study that uh, there was one and a half percent of men did go on to not only get metastatic cancer, but die from it. And then there was an additional 1.3% of patients who develop metastatic disease but are still alive. Uh, so that means that after 15 years of active surveillance for mostly low-risk disease, slightly under 3% of people ended up with cancer that spread. Um, so that's 97% of men did not. Um, and it was based those authors felt that because of that, uh, active surveillance is a very good way of following people. Is it perfect? No, but 3% or 2.8% is a pretty low number. And if you actually look at people who have low risk disease who do get treatment, uh, their chance of getting metastatic disease at by 15 years is not really very different than that. Um, and so, um, Again, it, it's just some data to support that active surveillance is a reasonable option for, for those low-risk patients. Um, yeah? Yeah. Uh, th when these patients were on active surveillance, were they also doing anything systematic about uh, diet or supplements? Mm -hmm. In the study, no, not about diet or supplements. They were, they were doing, obviously, PSA checks, digital uh, exams, and uh, doing uh, prostate biopsies. But there was nothing in the trial that said they, they sh there was no counseling in terms of any kind of diet. No. Yeah. Uh, with the um, recent advances in genetic testing and other, you know, uh, uh, testing beyond simple PSA, mm -hmm. do you envision a time when um, active surveillance will not require annual biopsies? Uh, I foresee that, yes. I mean, that these, 
genetic profile tests that you're referring to, I mean, there's three on the market right now. There's um, the um, uh, Decipher, and then there's the Oncotype one, and uh, then there's the Prolaris, um, and all of, all of them are probably going to turn out to be fairly predictive uh, in terms of how a kid is going to behave, not by looking at PSA and that, but by looking at the genetic makeup. We're not quite there yet, uh, but people are starting to use it to help make them more confident that active surveillance is the way to go. I mean, for example, if, if you do a Polaris test and it predicts that your cancer is much more indolent than average, um, then people can do active surveillance with more confidence. As far as I know, there wasn't any data in 2015 that sort of adds to the data that's already there. But we do it in the clinic all the time where someone's considering an active surveillance and they're not sure if they should do it. Uh, we get a Polaris test uh, if it indicates uh, low risk disease. We feel much more comfortable recommending it. Um, in these trials that I'm talking about, they didn't do that kind of testing. They, they just uh, treated everyone the same across the board. But uh, I foresee that, yes, in the future that we probably won't be having to do things like annual P uh, biopsies. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> my husband went to the Cleveland Clinic to have his prostate removed, and they did a decipher test for him. Right. But um, down here, are they doing any of those? Are they doing the decipher test? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Very. I wouldn't say it's universal that, every, that you do it on every patient, but it's available, and we certainly have a sent it. Um, and there's actually, there is a study that was published in 2015 that it doesn't pertain to active surveillance, but where the decipher really seems to be important in decision making. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be used more and more, and it's probably going to become much more common. Um, well, he was told um, that he would be more predisposed to um, bone cancer if this progressed too much. Mm -hmm. What are the differences between Decipher, Prolaris, and Oncotype? Sure, they look at different genes. Uh, uh, Prolaris, I think, um, I can't remember how many genes it is. Uh, well, Decipher is 22 genes. Uh, it's an RNA-based test. Um, the um, Oncotype test is a PCR test, and I think that's 12 genes. And Prolaris, I want to say it's like 31 genes, but I, I can't remember if that's right. I don't know what PCR. Oh, I'm sorry, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, it's just a way to uh, amplify DNA so you can measure it. Uh, so it's a DNA-based. And so all of these are trying to predict based on the genetic makeup, not of a single gene, but of a family of genes to try to predict how this the cancer would be. This is on a biopsy example? Yes, either biopsy or a prostatectomy specimen. What about cost? You know what? I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> I don't know what the cost is. Probably not cheap, though. Probably not. Just but the cost is coming down very quickly. I, I had the Polaris test on, and it was covered by insurance. Probably depends on the company, but mine was covered. Anyway. At one point, it was $3,000 early on for sure. Mm -hmm. pocket. Yeah, I'm sure with the competition, the, I'm, I'm assuming the cost is coming down, and uh, the, the cost of doing these keeps getting less and less. Uh, you know, we'll be able to do larger and larger genome genomes testing at, at cheaper and cheaper costs. So uh, I think it's really the way of the future. Yeah. Uh, have you heard of 3K score, and uh, have you ever used it? as a screening tool. I've not used it, no. It looks at three of the Philippines, not just one, right? Mm -hmm. but, and um, so, but you have not, you don't know about it. Okay. You, you said so there was a second 2015 yes. study? Yes, there was. <laughs> uh, so the second study was from Hopkins, uh, where obviously they have a very big urology group. And uh, what they did was uh, they had about 1,200 patients, 
And so it's a bigger study. And theirs was a little bit different in that the majority of theirs were very low risk. So about 70% of their cases were very low risk and only 30% were low risk. Um, so it's even a, a, a better population. And so uh, what they did was they checked the PSA <coughs> twice a year, they did digital rectal exams twice a year, and they did biopsies once a year. And if you uh, were up, brought up to a higher risk uh, state, so if you went from very low risk to low risk, or you went from low risk to intermediate risk, then you had definitive therapy. Uh, What's the difference between low risk and very low risk? Sure. So low risk is Gleason less than six, or six or lower, I'm sorry, PSA less than 10. Very low risk is those two things plus uh, what's called the PSA density uh, has to be less than 0.15, and that's the PSA divided by the volume of your prostate. Uh, and also, you can't have more than three cores uh, on if you have sextant biopsies, which is usually uh, 12 biopsies. You can't have more than three that are positive, and none of the cores have all the cores have that less than 50 percent involvement. Less than 50? Yes. Yes. So that's the difference. Uh, so anyway, so they were followed also for a period of uh, uh, 15 years. And um, in terms of the still not needing any therapy, um, it was uh, at five years, 65% were still just being watched. At 10 years, it was 50%. And at 15 years, it was about 40%. Uh, so a little bit more people ended up getting treatment eventually, uh, probably because the criteria to treat were much stricter. Um, and then in terms of how these people did, uh, they did extremely well. Um, uh, only 0.15% of people died from metastatic prostate cancer, and another 0.25% um, developed metastases but were alive. So that's a grand total of uh, developing metastatic disease or dying from it was only 0.4% or 4 out of 1,000 people. Uh, extremely low um, at 15 years. So, so based on that, that would be even stronger data that says it's safe to do active surveillance. Um, probably a little more than 50% chance you'll eventually need therapy, but delaying the therapy does not seem to put you at any greater risk of developing advanced disease. So that's the Hopkins study. Did they break out the results between the very low and low at the 15 year point? Or is it? Like I don't remember. 0.15 sounds great. <laughs> I don't think they did, but I have to go back and look at that uh, paper. Thank you. Yeah. Did, did either study uh, break down uh, the patients by age group? Uh, it would seem that it would be more advantageous for the younger men with low risk right. disease to have active surveillance rather than surgery or other treatment. Uh, I don't know if they broke the, I don't remember if they broke the results down. They did put it in the, in the study what the number of patients that were above or below 70. Mm -hmm. I just don't have those numbers on the top of my head, um, but they are available in the study. I can give you the references uh, afterwards if, if you want. Yes. Can you discuss, um, on another subject, can you discuss uh, the effects of hormonal therapy on brain function? You had mentioned something about that. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, I can talk about that next. Uh, before that, though, is there any other questions about active surveillance? Yeah, sure. I had a question about the uh, psychology of active surveillance. I know that from the discussions that, I, that we've had in, in this group, many people, if they're told that they have prostate cancer, they say, just get rid of it. I don't want to, I don't want to sit around. And yet, uh, we've had other people who have said, boy, I'm glad that I didn't go in for, for uh, uh, treatment when I did because the treatments that they had now are a whole lot better than the ones that they had 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any comment on that, that whether, whether there's a, a significant chance that by delaying for 10 or 15 years, there will be something new that is going to have a much higher cure rate and, and smaller uh, side effects? Well, we're, well, obviously, we're always progressing. Uh, I think there is that psychology of active surveillance. I think it's very hard to be told, well, you have cancer, and, and now we're not going to do anything. Yeah. 
Uh, it could be very hard to swallow. Um, but the data says that it's safe as long as you're picking the right people and as long as you're really doing the follow-up. If the treatments had no side effects, then it would be really easy. We just treat everybody. Right. The problem is, is that these the side effects are not necessarily trivial. You know, being impotent, being no. incontinent, having rectal bleeding. I mean, these are these are not good things to look at. Um, and so you're trying to balance all of that. I do believe that treatments are getting better and safer all the time. It's never as fast as you want. But yeah, I think in 10 years, we may have treatments that have fewer side effects than today. Yeah, I followed it. It's the four K score. It's these four color screens. And uh, it's, a, it's being put out by a company in Nashville, Tennessee. If you have not heard of it, I'll be happy to send you that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's these new genetic things coming up all the time. Right, it's not a genetic thing. Oh, it looks so for these four calocrines, which are... Oh, calocrines, okay. Calocrines. Yeah. I mean, I'm familiar with calocrines. I wasn't, I didn't realize they were looking at those for uh, trying to um, prognosticate. Yeah, but calocrines a protein that's it's been known about for a long time. Uh, so anyway, so I guess we could move on to the uh, cognitive uh, studies that were done. So uh, as background, uh, as most of you all know, certainly for metastatic disease, uh, hormone therapy is really the cornerstone of, of treatment. Uh, and certainly it's also used in people with high-risk disease, sometimes in people with intermediate risk disease. And um, even though it's, we think of it as a fairly easy treatment compared to some treatments, uh, that doesn't mean it's perfectly safe. Uh, and certainly, it, it's well known to cause hot flashes. It's well known to decrease muscle mass, uh, in, increase fat, uh, increase risk of cardiac events. Um, but one thing that really hasn't been looked at until very recently is, does it have any effect on uh, cognitive function? Um, and so uh, in that regard, there was two studies that came out in 2015 that showed there probably is a cognitive uh, effect of uh, hormone therapy. Uh, when I mean hormone therapy, I'm typically talking about Lupron or the drug similar to Lupron. Uh, and so the first study was a study from Moffitt, which is in Florida. Uh, and they looked over the course of a year at uh, 60 patients that had, uh, were on hormone therapy, and then another 160 who were not uh, in com and used them as the control. And what they do is they have these people take these tests, uh, these cognitive tests where you know, they ask them all kinds of questions uh, and it was very a long, long battery of, of testing and there was 13 different kinds of tests that they did. Uh, I'm not a cognition so I'm not familiar with all of the details of each questionnaire um, but it was, it was very broad. Uh, and so the, the sort of quick conclusion was, well, they tested all these people, and when you look at the average score before and after being home out therapy, there was no obvious differences. Uh, but then they really drilled down and said, well, were there any specific cognitive defects that they could see? You know, did, maybe someone did well overall, but maybe one or two things they, they didn't do so well. And so when they did that, they did start to clearly see uh, differences. Uh, what, the way they measured it uh, was they looked at what percentage of men scored, at least on one test, uh, two standard deviations below the mean, and that means basically you know, in about the fifth percentile. Um, and so uh, at baseline, um, all the men scored, a, they had at least one test where, uh, well, I'm sorry, 40% of men scored below two standard deviations below the mean on at least one test, um, uh, or at least you know, one endpoint. <clears throat> and after a year later, then they retested them, and the people who were not on hormone therapy, now it was only 25%. You say, well, why did these people over here do better? And it's because they've seen the test before. <clears throat> so they, you know, they figured out, so they do better. That's not unusual. 
But the, the men who, um, who uh, had been on hormones for a year, instead of 40%, it was now 50%. Um, and so it wasn't huge, but there was clearly a difference. And that's looking at only the course of one year. Um, and so from that, they concluded there probably is at least some cognitive decline in some men. And then what they did, which I think is even more interesting, is, is they, look, they started looking at some of the genes uh, in these men, because there are some genes uh, that are slightly different in different men, or different people in general. Not that one's normal and one's abnormal, but there's just what's called polymorphism. Um, and so they, there's one gene that's known uh, that can affect cognition. Uh, it's a G protein, and I think it's called GNB3. Um, I think that, I'm pretty sure that's the name. Uh, and so they looked at men who had a certain subtype of that. And those men, because it's known that those people tend to have a little bit more cognitive problems with age. And those men, if they didn't get androgen blockade, there was no change or improvement, as you'd expect. Uh, but then the men who got androgen deprivation, the score, the poor scoring went from 40% to 80%. Uh, and so it seems that you could pull out a subgroup of people who don't really decline on their own, but in response to androgen or other stressors, it's much more apparent. Uh, yeah. It's a result of low testosterone, isn't it? Yes. So the expectation is somehow related to having low testosterone will lead to this cognitive defect. So these were pretty subtle uh, changes. But again, it's only one year of, 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 of time frame of looking. I think that the second study, uh, I think, is also interesting and probably even more so. <clears throat> and this was a study that came out of uh, data from Stanford and Mount Sinai. <coughs> they looked at this in a completely different way. Uh, with electronic medical records, now you can start seeing lots of things um, because you don't, it's easy to go back and look at things. You can see not only what's happening with the urologist, but what's happening with the neurologist and the primary care doctor and everything else. So they went back and they looked at five million uh, people, because that was how many people are, go through those systems. Uh, and they looked at them over 15 years. And out of these five million people, there was about 16,000 uh, prostate cancers and about 2,000 or 2,500 men who were on androgen deprivation, uh, these hormone therapies. <clears throat> and the advantage they had is that now they could see them not only over a much longer period of time, but they could see what was happening with all their other doctors they were seeing. And, uh, and so the bottom line is that uh, for men who had prostate cancer but never went on hormone therapy, uh, 15 years after their diagnosis, about 4% of them developed Alzheimer's disease, uh, which is not, this is more or less expected given age group and time and the prevalence of Alzheimer's in the community. For patients who were on androgen deprivation, the incidence of Alzheimer's at 15 years was about 7%. It doesn't seem like a big number, but it's almost double. And then if they looked at people who were on hormone therapy for more than 12 months, um, the 15-year incidence of Alzheimer's was 9%. Uh, so again, um, it's all retrospective looking backwards, and it's just reviewing charts and electronic records. But it certainly suggests that uh, that may be another potential downside of long-term hormone therapy uh, is that uh, there is, there are apparently seems to be a higher risk of Alzheimer's. So another thing to take into consideration um, when you think about taking these things, uh, again, they're, they have their upsides, but they also have their potential downsides. Uh, so that's pretty much what the latest in terms of uh, that subject is, uh, at least in the literature. You mentioned statins, too. Yes, I did. A lot of us are on statins. <laughs> yeah, I would assume probably. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that there's been a lot of um, 
anecdotal stuff, and there hasn't been as much really robust, uh, what we would say, you know, robust data that um, sort of makes it more, I don't know, mainstream is the right word, but much more accepted across uh, all comers. Uh, so it's always been a little bit confusing to me, at least, why would statins even work? Um, you know, there's been lots of talk about not only prostate cancer, but in other cancers, statins seem to lower the risk of cancer. Some studies show it's helpful, some studies show it don't. No one really seems to know what's going on. I mean, it lowers cholesterol, yes, but why would lowering cholesterol affect uh, prostate cancer cells? And why, when you put statins, uh, add statins, it seems like prostate cancer cells don't grow as well. Is it really part of its effect on cholesterol? Is there some, something completely different happening? And how strong is this effect really? And so uh, with that kind of background, um, the, the major study that came out in 2015 that really supports the use of statin uh, came out of Dana-Farber, uh, which is uh, Harvard's uh, hosp uh, cancer hospital. And what they did was they said, okay, we're gonna go back and look at all of our patients who are on hormone therapy. They, they're specifically looking at people who already had cancer, not in terms of cancer prevention. Um, so I'm only talking specifically about people who have cancer and the effect of statins. So they took all the men that they had in their database that had been on hormone therapy, and they looked at how long did the hormones work, uh, how long did first-line hormones work uh, in all their patients, and they divided people who had been on a statin and people who had not been on a statin. Uh, and what they saw was that the patients who were also on a statin the hormone, first line hormone therapy worked for about 27 months, and if they weren't on a statin, it only worked for about 17 months. So that's a pretty big difference of 10 months. Um, and so that, uh, again, it's retrospective, but it really helps support that statins are doing something. Uh, but then they went one step further, and they said, well, we really want to try to answer the question, or at least propose a reasonable hypothesis as to why uh, do the statins actually work? And it turns out that the way for a, st a statin to get inside a cell, it can't, drugs don't just go into a cell. They have, there has to be some way for them to get in. And there's actually what's called a transport system. It's like a pump that allows the statin to get inside the cell. <clears throat> and there's a special pump that allows that to get in the cell. Uh, and, and that pump is called SLCO. 2B1. I guess the name doesn't really matter, but, it, but that's what it's called for those who want to know that. But you can call it the statin pump. Uh, but it turns out that the most, one of the most active uh, testosterone precursors, which is DHEA sulfate, I don't know if you guys are, or DHEAS, they use the exact same pump. Um, and so you have two things fighting for the same pump. One gets left out, uh, and, and so in the presence of statins, cells really can't take up DHEA, <coughs> D, DHEAS very well, uh, and so that provides at least a reason why would statins actually do this. So it seems that the statins are partially starving the cells of hormones, and that would be a reasonable explanation why they actually seem to do what they do. Uh, so that seemed very intriguing. They didn't prove that it, that was the reason, but uh, it was a pretty strong argument that uh, that's at least maybe one methodology by how the statins uh, help in prostate cancer. Uh, so, so that was, go, go ahead. I, I think you used the phrase, whether or not statins work. What, what do you mean by work in this context? What is it working on? What is it changing? What it was doing, it was changing the length of time that the treatment worked. So, how do you define the treatment worked? I guess that's. Oh, oh, oh. Um, what, are they, bathroom, what are they bathroom. measuring before statins and after statins? So, typically, it's either progression of disease, either by pictures. 
or by rising PSA. Okay. Sorry. Are we ready to switch topics? I don't know, does, do people have more questions about uh, that study? There was really only that one study to my work in terms of statins that was um, very interesting to me, at least to me. Yeah? Oh, statins all have side effects, right? So it's not... Yes, they do. <laughs> it's not a freebie. What are the side effects of statins? Sure. Um, muscle aching um, is the most common. Muscle and then the extreme form of that is actually muscle damage. Uh, and the other is uh, sometimes it can affect the liver, where you can get uh, liver damage. So uh, I don't remember what the percentage is, but typically three, five percent of people have to stop statins uh, because of those kind of things. So yes, it's not without its downsides. And it does protect you from heart attacks too. <laughs> billions of people that take it. Yes, yeah, it's yeah, it's one of the most common um, drugs used in family. Yeah. I was wondering if you view hormone therapy as a replacement for radiation or prostatectomy, or just as a way to delay the need for it. Uh, you know, it really is in the context of what's happening to the patient, so it's really hard to answer that in a generic sense. I would. Almost never do I say it's a replacement for those. It's just another tool. Uh, sometimes it's used instead, sometimes it's used in addition. But I don't think it would ever replace um, surgery or, or radiation. But in terms of specifically, well, when would I use it? When would I use it? When would I add it to radiation? When would I use it instead of radiation? It really depends on the exact situation that's in front of me. So can you give an example? Just a generic example when you would use it in combination with some of your other sure. options. Sure. So uh, the most common time is most anyone who has intermediate risk prostate cancer, my standard of care, unless there's a reason to deviate from that, if the patient elects to have uh, radiation therapy, uh, I typically recommend six months of uh, hormone therapy with it. Uh, for people who have high-risk disease, if they elect to have radiation, uh, I also recommend hormone therapy uh, at, with it. And typically, I recommend at least two years of hormone therapy with the radiation. Uh, so that would be an example of using it in combination. Uh, is that particularly because you're concerned whether radiation fully did the job, or is there evidence that it didn't do the job, or what, why, why would you follow radiation with that? Sure. So the thing about um, cancer treatments is that often you can sit there and you can rationalize things, and you can say, well, this I should do this because it sounds great, or I do this because Joe Schmo down the street does it, so I'm going to do it too. I mean, those things don't really carry water. I mean, really, everything is data-driven. It's like someone says, well, why are you doing it this way? And it's like, well, because we've tried 30 other ways, and it just seems to work the best. We don't always know why, but we just know that the best outcomes are that way. And so there have been trials, particularly in high-risk disease, where one group's just gotten radiation, and other group's gotten a combination. And the people that get the combination, they do better. They have fewer recurrences, or if they recur, it takes much longer to recur. And so that's why we do it. Um, you can make up any story you want to say why it's that way, but that's what the data says, is that it works. The best outcomes are when you do it that way. It's very empirical. Dr. Mannion, how, this is a question I'm sure that everybody would like to know the answer to, including yourself, but is there anything on the horizon that when you are discovered to have prostate cancer, whether it's going to grow fast, not grow at all, live to be 100 with it, mm -hmm. what I have <clears throat> in my research the younger the person that's found with prostate cancer, the more dangerous it is. Is that a true statement or not? 
50-year-old men have a 45-year-old man, you have a tougher time, and it seems to grow with them quicker than a 70 to 75-year-old man, uh, from the data that I've read. It, it may be, but I, I think if you adjust for the Gleason score, that I mean, a 45-year-old with a Gleason 6 shouldn't behave all that differently than a 70-year-old with a Gleason 6. Uh, now, the 45-year-old has many more years to live, so he may live long enough for it to become important where the 70 year old may not. But the cancer itself, at least to my knowledge, isn't more aggressive now. Young men like 45 may have a, a higher chance of having a higher Gleason score, and thereby it's more aggressive. But inherently, just because of their age and nothing, and no other factors, I'm, I'm not sure it necessarily has to be that that, it, that that is true. Does testosterone have a play in the in that progression or not? The more testosterone you have, if you have cancer, it grows more quicker. Has any study been on that? Been done on that? For instance, I was told not to take any testosterone. I wanted to get in the gym and bulk up, and they said, "With your condition, I wouldn't do that." No, I, I certainly wouldn't. I mean, there's no question that testosterone stimulates prostate cancer and yes. people who, who get testosterone supplements, there is a slightly higher risk of, those people do have a higher incidence of developing prostate cancer. Uh, on, on the flip side, pe um, people who at a very young age like lost a testicular function for some reason or you know, back in the day when there was Unix, um, they didn't get prostate cancer. Um, so there is a link. There's some hard work. Oh yes. <laughs> what about the major question of what's on the horizon today that's sure. brand new that will tell a man that's discovered to have prostate cancer whether he is the type that can let it go forever, or he needs surgery, or he needs a delivery system for radiation. I think that's where these uh, gene arrays, you know, these panels of gene testing, uh, that's, that's where it's going. So the expectation is that's going to get home, it's going to get better and better, and so hopefully till we finally get to the point where, you know, we don't really care about the PS anymore, we don't really care about the Gleason score anymore. We do this genetic panel and we can tell you, is it going to be aggressive, is it not? Do you have to worry or not? We're not quite there yet, but I think that's where the future is. How far away do you think in your estimation? You see it? How long can we stall? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a really tough question. But, uh, I mean, if you extrapolate from breast cancer, for example, I mean, breast cancer, um, they're a little bit ahead in terms of doing this genetic testing and who needs therapy and who doesn't. Um, and they started doing that kind of testing routinely on every patient, probably about seven years ago. Um, and so they're, they're, for, they're, they're still not at the point where you can totally predict with great precision. It's better. And so my guess, it still could be a good 15, 20 years away before we have something that's really trustworthy. I think your information may not be correct on that because my wife had breast cancer last year and her doctor said she should do a uh, gene test, and her insurance company refused to pay for it. So it, was it the Oncotype test? Did they not pay? I mean, usually, if, as long as they're ER, we're getting off the topic, but ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative, they should. It, most insurance companies do cover it. Not this time. Um, I, I think that's more the exception than the rule. Um, we send it often virtually, almost 100% of people who meet the characteristics. Yeah? I don't know the right word, so I'll use impressive, because I don't know what impressive means. Are there any studies that tell us certain foods are going to prevent cancer, certain foods are going to cause cancer, certain foods will greatly increase your chance of feeding cancer, Tell us about studies on foods. Are you talking about cancer in general or prostate? Any kind of cancer. So because usually 
if you got the problem with prostate cancer, I'm just assuming you don't do some kind of change, you have a chance of getting another kind of cancer. Is that a false assumption? So, uh, it, it's, it, there's so many things that go into putting someone at risk for cancer. And diet is probably only one of the <coughs> many things that are involved. Uh, it's certainly been shown, um, for example, in the West, like a high fat diet puts you at higher risk for certain cancers. But that's not the whole story because, for example, in Japan, where they have a very high amount of fish, there's a much higher risk of stomach cancer. Um, and so um, what you do might protect you from one thing, but it may make you more susceptible to something else. Um, there's no question that there's a certain randomness to cancer that uh, certainly a lot of it is not under our control. There was a good study done, a guy named Bert Vogelstein, who's at Hopkins. No, no, he's at, yeah, he's at Hopkins, I believe still. Uh, and he's a genetic, genetic type of researcher. And they were able to show, I can't remember, something like two thirds of all cancers are probably just completely random because our cells are dividing. And because they're dividing and growing and they have to replicate the DNA, that mistakes are made. And every once in a while, a mistake gets through that leads to cancer. And it had nothing to do with environment, it had nothing to do with diet, it had nothing to do with your genes. So even if we found things like diet that we really can control, it's not going to eliminate cancer. It may sway things you know, a little more likely, a little less likely, but it's not going to be like a totally protective or totally causative. Um, but other than things like high fat is not necessarily good. Things that stimulate insulin levels to be high uh, are not good. Um, it's hard to get much more granular than that. People have tried looking at a lot of very specific things. Uh, probably one of the most famous is you know, looking at vitamin E. Everyone talked about how vitamin E was going to be so protective. And a famous study um, looking at trying to prevent lung cancer in smokers, uh, they had a big study where half the people got vitamin E and the other half didn't. Guess which group had more cancers? <laughs> the vitamin E group. Uh, and so things that sound really good don't always pan out when you test for it. Um, I mean, I think a, a well-balanced diet that's not too high in carbohydrates, that's not too high in fat, uh, is typically what I recommend. Uh, specifically for prostate cancer, a lot of things have been looked at. Vitamin E has been looked at. Lycopene's been looked at. Um, selenium. Selenium, thanks. That's what I was thinking. The, I was trying to get that. Uh, selenium. Uh, most of these things, exception maybe with the exception of lycopene, um, haven't really panned out. There's a lot of exciting excitement and then disappointment. Um, so I think trying to focus, oh, if there's this one magic bullet, of, if I take this or avoid this, you're probably missing the picture. I think it's more of just global health uh, in general. Because uh, I don't think there is a, uh, a single magic bullet out there, even though we'd love to believe that. I just don't think it's that easy. I see a question about androgen deprivation. If people that are on that a long time, then the, the gland will actually recover it, won't require it anymore. Isn't that right? If you're on the on the the hormone for treatment for a long time, your prostate will be able to synthesize the, an equivalent of the testosterone? So yes, yeah, so what uh, it, you're absolutely right. For so for people who have metastatic disease where there's active cancer in their body and you treat them with hormone therapy. It works really well. 90% of the time, it will control that cancer. Almost inevitably, unless you die from something else, eventually, the cancer is going to figure out how to get around it. Uh, and there's lots of different ways it does it, but it virtually always figures out a way. Um, and there, there's just some of the mechanisms, are, are, I'll just name some of them. One is that all the shot does when you take first-line hormone therapy is 
stop the testicles from making testosterone. It's not the only place your body makes testosterone. Your adrenal glands make some testosterone, um, so there's always some floating around. Uh, and, and secondly, often the cancer itself figures out how to make its own testosterone. Um, so that starts to happen. Uh, also, the prostate cancer cells, they begin to make much more of this thing called the androgen receptor. That's sort of the antenna, the, the thing that the hormone sticks to. So we can grow with a lot less hormone around. Um, that's another way it bypasses it. Uh, there can be mutations in the androgen receptor. That's the thing, again, the thing that really drives the cancer to grow. That instead of, normally only testosterone should activate it, but there's mutations that now uh, progesterone will activate it, any old steroid will activate it, you know, prednisone will activate it, other things will activate it. Um, it can even have mutations where it, the androgen receptor activates itself. It doesn't need anything anymore to activate itself. It's just permanently turned on. Um, so there's all kinds of mutations that eventually occur. Um, a lot of the second line hormone therapies try to bypass some of that. Um, but you're right. It, it's never a permanent solution, uh, first line hormone therapy. Are you familiar with finasteride? Mm -hmm. Well, how does that work? So that's also called ProScar. Uh, it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It, it's, it's an enzyme inhibitor. Um, it, uh, I thought it, it uh, got in the way of conversion to the dihydroxy. Right, right. So it's, not, it's only working at the level of the prostate gland. It's not working at the whole body level, is that right? Well, it, it, is? it I mean, it, it works at, at several levels. It's actually not really used in active prostate cancer. It has been used to try to prevent prostate cancer. It's not really strong enough to really have much effect in active cancer, so it's not totally typically used. Uh, as I said, it has been used to prevent prostate cancer, but it's never really caught on. For variety of reasons. <coughs> for prevention or for? No. You took my uh, PSA from 12 to 2. Yeah, I mean, you can do that, but typically, it, so we don't use it very much. Uh, it just believes not to be quite as active as some of the other stuff, but it definitely can work. It's just a. Is it dangerous to take? No. No. <laughs> My doctor said that he's given it for for decades up to people. And mm -hmm. That's their good effect. But if you take that, you don't have the, the problems that you have with some like a Lupron and so forth. You don't have any of the, the side effects. Of it. Oh, it, it's much. Uh, yeah, I mean the side effects are minimal. Um, it just tends not to yeah. work as long <laughs> or as as well, or as in many people, as some of the other stuff. But certainly if you're looking to avoid, uh, let's say you don't want to have the side effects of Lupron, or you take Lupron and the side effects are just horrible, uh, there's certainly all alternatives, and that's one of them. The other one that's probably a little more common in that situation is to use what's called high-dose Casadex. Uh, we use normal dose is 50 milligrams, we use 150. Um, so that's almost as good as hormones, but not, again, not quite. So yeah, there are some alternatives to Lupron. Um, and they have fewer side effects, but they tend to be work a little less well. But again, you're kind of weighing benefit cancer-wise or versus quality of life. Doctor? Yeah. I'm the postcard for this I can give you one scientific, one scientific data point. Uh, we have a family history, my siblings, prostate cancer. Two of my brothers, 20 years younger than me, uh, got it. Uh, I don't now. Uh, I've been taking ProScar for about 20, uh, 15 years, probably a dozen years, anyway. Just because my doctor was interested in the study that was going on. And uh, so I kind of look at it pretty favorably. Never had any side effects that bothered me. Also, uh, he told me. It helps you have a strong urinary stream. That's pretty good. And hair growth. 
Yes. Well, I'm not saying it's, there, there's definitely data that says that it helps prevent prostate cancer. Uh, so if you're taking it to prevent prostate cancer from occurring in the first place, there's strong data to support that. Um, sometimes it's hard to convince a man to take a pill every day to prevent a cancer that he's never had. Um, but would you recommend that to children or grandchildren of someone who does have prostate cancer? Well, certainly grandchildren start at that young. Uh, <laughs> well, depending but, on the age. But I would course. say age 50 or higher, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, there's data out there to say that it, that it does help. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, it's somewhere around a 25% reduction in mm -hmm. the incidence of prostate cancer. Um, but I guess the counter argument is, well, let's say, you know, in a man's lifetime, in terms of getting clinically significant prostate cancer, let's just say for the sake of argument, it's 10%. Okay. And so, if he, and he doesn't have a family history, because that's a little different. But let's say he has no family history, so he may have a 10% chance of getting what we call clinically significant prostate cancer. He takes ProScar every day, and that will decrease his risk from 10% to 7.5%. So that means you're going to treat 100 people with this drug every day to prevent 2.5 cancers. Should you do it? Shouldn't you do it? I, I don't know what the answer is. But your hair, bro. If you're the two, if you're one of the, if you're two, one of the two, it's great. That's what I'm saying. If you're one of the other 98, you're like, why am I doing this? Uh, so yeah, it's helpful, but why doesn't everybody do it? And that's kind of the why not everybody does it. Yeah. Is that the finasteride and the <coughs> tickets do tasteride? Is that the same? As, or are they close to like Avidar? Are they all? Yeah, yeah, they're in the same the family. family. Yeah. Is one stronger than the other? Or? I, I, it's always hard to know when you say stronger, but I guess most people think of Avidar as being a little more potent. Yes. <clears throat> but you said there is. Data, maybe you own 25 grams, that it can prevent. But is there any data that shows that it slows down the progression from, from indolent to aggressive or anything? You've you know, already I, got it. Off the top of my head, I can't quote you data. There may be out there. Uh, I just don't have it on the top of my head. Yeah. Um, I had a question. When biopsies are taken from the prostate, is there any chance that that, and, and if they find that those cells that are biopsies that they've taken are cancerous, by going into the prostate and removing those cells, can that trigger more cells to develop by disturbing the inside of the prostate and taking you know, those samples? Can that trigger more cells to grow, cancer cells? I'm not aware of doing a biopsy stimulates the cancer to get worse than if you just left it alone. Is that what your question is? Um. I, I don't think there's any evidence to say that it does that. The other question a lot of people say is, well, if I'm going to stick a needle in the prostate and pull something out, am I going to spread the cancer? Or, um, yeah. And there, in prostate cancer, I'm not aware of any evidence that that happens. Having said that, there are some other cancers where it can happen, where you do a biopsy and then you see later on cancer cells like growing up along where the needle was. Um, and that's particularly in something called sarcomas. It can happen. And so typically if you want to biopsy a sarcoma, you have to be extremely careful how you do it. But it's never been shown in prostate cancer to be an issue. Let's, you want me to go on to one of the other topics? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember what I have now. <laughs> How about? New drugs. Yeah. How about new drug? Okay. So, uh, have, have any of you heard of a laparid? No. Okay. 
So that's good. So something you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How do so, you spell a P? Say O L A P A R I B. Can you find that by one more time? O L A P A R I B. Okay. So um, this, this is a drug that's relevant for people who have what's called castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So we're talking about people who have fairly advanced disease. Um, what uh, Olaparib is, it's something called, in terminology that we use, we call it a PARP1 inhibitor. Now, what's PARP1? PARP1 is a, is a molecule that we all have that's extremely important in repairing uh, DNA that's been damaged. Every time our cells replicate, we have to replicate the entire DNA that we have, and mistakes are made. Mistakes are made all the time. And in fact, what the cell has devised over time is several redundant systems that will go and edit and repair any damage that's been done. Um, and because it's so important, it doesn't rely on just one system. So we have uh, part one is one of the systems. Um, genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, which you may have heard in breast cancer. These are DNA damage repair systems. There's another gene called ATM that's also involved in uh, DNA repair. So there's a lot, the cell spends a lot of energy spent trying to fix DNA damage, okay? Um, and so th this drug blocks one of those systems. Uh, the repair? The repair system. That's not good, though. It isn't, but okay. just hear me out, just so you understand it. <laughs> so what's been shown is that many cancers, um, they develop because they had a defect in a different DNA repair system. So you can imagine if you have DNA that's normal, and then it, Damage builds up, you eventually get a cancer, okay? And so BRCA1, BRCA2, and breast cancer is the prototype um, where those people have a very high risk of eventually getting cancer in their lifetime. Um, but if you, let's say you had a cell that already has a lot of DNA damage and it can't fix itself very well and it's already a cancer cell, but it can fix its DNA somewhat by these other systems and you block that, then you get so much DNA damage that the cell just dies. Okay, and well, so that's how radiation kills the cell anyway, right? It's by DNA damage. damage. Yes. Exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, that's a good analogy. Um, you, know, you cause enough DNA damage if it's too overwhelming, the cell will die. So, PARP1 inhibitors have been tried in many cancers, and they tend not to work very well because there's all these redundant systems that just kick in. But if the redundant systems aren't there, that it might work really well. So uh, recently they did a study in prostate cancer to say, well, does this drug work in prostate cancer or not? And lo and behold, for people who have very advanced cancer, um, this was a very small study, but it was 50 patients, and overall a third of the patients had a good response, uh, which actually, in, our rule is pretty good if someone has already failed lots of other stuff. One out of three is actually a pretty good number. What, then, was, the, what was the name of the study? Um, I don't remember the name of the study. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. Um, I can get to the exact um, volume and page if you want. I just don't have it on here. Um, but then what they did was they said, you know what, we're going to take these cancers and we're going to look specifically at genes that are involved in DNA damage and are they there or, or are they missing? Um, because you, theoretically, PARP1 should only work if there's other DNA damage systems already not working. And so what they did was they looked at, these genes may not mean anything, but BRCA2, which is very common in breast cancer, um, seven out of the 50 patients, so that's about 15% of these prostate cancer patients had a BRCA2 mutation in prostate cancer. And of those 
every single one of them had a response to this drug, 100%. And then there was about 10% who had a, a mutation in this ATM gene, which is another DNA repair gene. 80% of them responded. And then there was another, there's some other genes also that are involved in DNA repair. And those, 100% of them responded to this drug. Uh, so it seems that if you extrapolate, uh, if this holds up in other studies, you could take someone's prostate cancer and look for these gene mutations. And if they're there, mm -hmm. you say, you know what? This drug's going to work with 80, 90% confidence. Mm -hmm. And if, if they didn't have one of these DNA repair gene mutations, response rate was only 5%. So it's a way, now that there's a drug that's brand new that uh, we know beforehand who it's going to work on and who it's not going to work on. Mm -hmm. So we don't waste our time giving it to everybody. Uh, and so that's probably the newest exciting drug that's coming down the pike um, for prostate cancer. Yeah? Uh, another con well, another couple of genes that have been researched for many years are P53 and PT, and they're both associated with the response to radiation, like radiation is similar to modern. So P53 is again one of these genes that repairs uh, the uh, DNA device. Mm -hmm. um, were, were these two uh, associated with the success of this uh, trial? I don't know if they checked for P53, uh, or I don't think they checked P53 specifically. P53 is more a uh, it does so many things, it, it's, it regulates so many other things. It's not, these are genes, the ones I'm talking about are genes that really do the actual editing, um, whereas P53 is more a regulator of all that. Um, but I didn't see that they had, you only know what they say they tested for, they didn't mention that they looked at P53. But at least when they use this drug in other things, like they've used it in ovarian cancer and breast cancer, it only seems to be if they have a defect in some of these more specific editing systems that it seems to work. Another question is, now you're talking about people who have metastatic disease, so yep. it's spread throughout the body, it's here and there and everywhere. So um, how, how do these drugs actually find the cancers? Uh, you know, especially when they can be really distant sites you may have just injected it into the bloodstream and, and hope it's going to work, or is there some way of targeting these sites? For example, you know, there's a lot of, there's what's called theranostics now. There's this whole avenue of thought that, well, you know, you can attack, you can create a, a drug or a molecule that looks for PSMA, right? It sniffs out PSMA and you can attach a toxin or, or a radioisotope to it and it'll go to, the, to these metastatic sites and kill the cancer. But for other chemotherapy uh, drugs, how do they actually, how do they work? And do, is that part of the reason perhaps why <coughs> some of them are less effective than others? Um, the cancer just hides very well. Or, so, uh, So no, these, these drugs obviously don't know where the cancer is. <clears throat> now, cancer cells, they, they need to survive just like normal cells. So without a blood supply, they can't survive. <clears throat> so the expectation is that uh, as long as the blood goes there, that the drug will go there and at least expose itself to the cell. Uh, now, is it gonna get there at a high enough concentration to kill the cell? You know, that's a, a, you know, a question that it may or may not, because some of these uh, areas where the tumors are have more, a better or less good blood supply. Uh, but typically it's felt that the better the blood supply to the tumor, the better the chemotherapy is going to work or whatever therapy it is. But even the targeted therapy that you're talking about, uh, it still has to get there in the first place in a non-specific way. It's just that when it gets there, will it stick? Um, and Typically, typically, it hasn't been so much in prostate cancer, but in other cancers, uh, lymphoma, there's a drug called rituxan. It works extremely well and it's very targeted. Uh, breast cancer, all the HER2 
um, drugs, um, they bind to something very specific and they're attached to toxins like you mentioned. Uh, so they do seem to work, but it doesn't know beforehand where the tumor is. It just goes passively by the bloodstream and then when it gets there, it just uh, is able to, to stay there um, by binding to very specific proteins. Um, but there are places in the body where we know chemotherapy gets in very poorly, uh, and that's particularly the brain, um, because there's something called the blood-brain barrier where uh, it's there to protect us from toxins, because you know we go out and we eat all kinds of things, and these things would be extremely toxic to our brain, and so there's particularly protective systems to our brain to protect us from all of that. It also protects our brain from chemotherapy toxins, so. Uh, Typically, uh, chemotherapies don't work very well for any cancer in the brain. A couple exceptions. So it doesn't always get everywhere, you're right. Uh, yeah? Where are we on personalized immunotherapy for prostate cancer versus other cancers in general? Like, didn't President Carter have that and said he is now cancer free? Of all right, so um, what personalized can uh, cancer treatment is that uh, you, well, let me back up. Well, Typically, let me, let me inter interrupt. Would Provenge be in that category? I mean, it's an immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really what I would call personalized medicine, though, because we don't look at someone and say, you will benefit from Provenge you will not benefit from But I mean, they take your cells and treat them and then return them to your body, is that not correct? Yes, it's a form of immunotherapy, it's a, it's a vaccine therapy. Mm -hmm. um, what President Carter got is not really personalized medicine at all, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think. Uh, I think he got immunotherapy, so he, they active, he got drugs that activate the immune system mm -hmm. to kill the cancer. Um, cancer cells are very smart, and what they do is they, they send a signal to the immune system saying, I'm part of the body, don't touch me. Uh, and um, the immune system listens. And so what these immunotherapies are doing, at least with President Carter and these other things for melanoma, is that it strips that signal off the cancer cell, so it no longer can mimic the normal cell. And the immune system says, oh my gosh, there's these things here, I better attack them now. Um, and that's how it works. I think of personalized medicine, at least the way I think of it, as a way to test someone to predict, are you going to respond to this, are you, the individual, going to respond to this particular drug, or aren't you? <laughs> Is it worth giving you this drug? Because up until now, things like chemotherapy and most drugs, we use it purely based on statistics. Okay, there's a 40% chance it will work in you, in, in the population. There's a 70% chance it will work in the population. So, you know, if we have a drug that has a 40% chance of working in the population versus 70% in the population, what we're gonna give is a drug that has a 70% chance. But it's all based on population, it's not based on you. We don't know if maybe that drug that only works in 40% of people is gonna be much better for you. That's personalized medicine. Um, that's where something uh, like the drug I just talked about um, is predictive, because you can do a test, and then you can say, 90% chance of working, no, only 5% chance of working in you. Um, we do have, so we're starting to have that in prostate cancer. We're not as good as some other cancers. I would say still the best is probably breast cancer, uh, where you do all these tests beforehand and you can start really predicting, you're gonna respond to this or you're not. I'd say they're probably the most ahead, but everyone's starting to catch up. Um, lung cancer, there's, uh, a, sometimes you can predict who's gonna respond to something and who isn't. Um, but I think it's only going to get better and better. We're going to get more and more of what we call personalized medicine, where you know, I'll have 10 people with prostate cancer, and they're all going to get 10 different treatments, not 
based on these population studies, but based on their own genetics. Am I going to live long enough for that? No. Sure answer, no. Well, I mean, I think to at least a certain extent. Maybe not completely that way, but it's, it, there's no question the field is trending in that direction. A lot of money in research, and there's research going on now in prostate specific. Oh, yes. Yes, there's a lot. But you know, like anything else, research, <coughs> when you find something in the research lab all the time, it's something that translates to a drug that helps a person that you can pull off the shelf <coughs> that the FDA has approved. I mean, that typically is a 10, 12 year process. It's, it's not something that happens very quickly. Unfortunately. Usually the new drugs too, they only uh, uh, allow them for extend, uh, extensive uh, disease. They don't usually allow you to have it for a mild disease, right? They don't. Yeah, historically, uh, especially because a lot of these drugs are toxic and sometimes side effects can come up that are unknown. For those historical reasons, when a new drug comes to be studied in humans for the first time, <coughs> almost always people like the FDA will only let you use it in the sickest patients who are probably only going to live a short period of time. Because if there's something really catastrophic or dangerous about it, you don't really want to give it anyway. <coughs> it's less bad to give it to them than to give it to someone who's otherwise totally healthy, who's, let's say, in remission and you're trying to prevent the cancer from coming back. So historically, <coughs> you start off with a very sick person. If it seems to have any benefit, then you move it to the healthier people and kind of backwards like that. It means that progress is slower that way, but it's probably also safer. Uh, and so you're trying to balance this safety versus uh, helping people. And that's just how our government has decided to do it. Isn't it true that they spent about five times the money on breast cancer research than they have on prostate cancer, maybe 10, 15? I, I don't know the answer to that, but wow. it's, I'm I mean, sure it's more. I don't know how much more. I mean, we can hear it. Yeah. Breast cancer. Yeah. Yeah, just um, to, just to frame the uh, hormonal treatments, um, if you're on active surveillance and you opt for hormone treatment, are you leaving active surveillance now you've, you've elected a treatment option, or do you consider that as part of your active surveillance program? No, if you, if you were on active surveillance and you decided to do hormone therapy, that would be considered treatment. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be considered active surveillance anymore. But I would tell you that from a practical standpoint, it would be extremely unusual for someone to go from active surveillance to hormones. Because typically, hormones by themselves is only used for people who have metastatic disease. <clears throat> Almost always, if you get out of active surveillance, you're either going to surgery or you're going to radiation. <coughs> 99% of the time. So then hormone therapy would be an adjunct to either radiation or or an adjunct to radiation. No. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. I have a question. When, sure. when a prostatectomy is performed, there is a pathology report that follows. Yes. What is it telling you? Sure. Um, it's telling us a few things. It, it tells us, number one, did you get all of the cancer? And number two is, are there features there that would predict you're going to do well in the future or maybe not so well in the future? Because of the nature of the cancer itself? Yes. Well, or, or not only the nature of the cancer itself, but also maybe where it's located. So to give you some concrete examples, uh, if you take the prostate out and you examine it under the microscope and you have just a small focus of cancer inside the prostate, it's nowhere near the edge, um, and it's not invading into small blood vessels or invading nerve where nerves are running through, uh, that would be considered a, someone who's very unlikely to have a recurrence. If someone takes a prostate out and it, it's growing through the capsule, uh, or it's growing into what's called the seminal vesicle, which comes out of the prostate, it sits directly behind the prostate, uh, or you have what's called a positive margin. That means you know the cancer went right up to where the surgeon cut, 
which means he probably got through it, not around it. Those people obviously are at much higher risk of having a recurrence. So that would that might drive you to do something additional after the prostatectomy potentially. Um, so those are the kind of things that you look at. Um, so it's not really just an exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, it does help figure out what you might have to do after that. And you said it shows whether you've got it all or not. Is that because of this margin stuff or something? Or is there more to it than that? Well, typically it's the, the margin. Yeah. Yep. How often is it the case after that, that or after the prostatectomy, that the situation was worse than what the biopsy indicated? I can't quote you an exact number, but it's certainly well known that certainly the Gleason score sometimes goes up because when you when you do a prostate biopsy, you're only sampling a very tiny percentage of the total, and so you don't really get to see the entire picture. My, I mean, it's just off the top of my head in terms of my patients, I would say probably 10% or so uh, believe they have a certain Gleason score and then after the prostatectomy they find out that it was worse. So it, it definitely happens. That's one of the um, uh, I don't know, not so satisfying things about the biopsies is, is that they have some accuracy but they're not don't have great accuracy in that regard. Yeah. Well, once a patient is op opted for either a prostatectomy or a radiation therapy with or without other treatment, what would you regard as um, success? What PSA level, like below 0 0.05, below 0 0.02? You know, you, you would be getting tested periodically, basically forever after that point. So it depends what kind of treatment you have. If you have a prostatectomy, the expectation is that if it was a successful surgery, your PSA becomes undetectable. Okay, so that's for the surgery. For radiation, it almost never gets down to undetectable. Um, it goes down to a low level, but there isn't a one accepted number. You know, is it 0.2, is it 0.4, is it 0.6? but it should go down to some number below one, and it should stay down there uh, once it's down there. There may be a little bit of what we call a PSA bounce, um, but it should stay relatively low, uh, but it will fluctuate some. Uh, PSA, what we call PSA failure, once it reaches its low point, um, either surgery or with radiation, what's called a biochemical failure, meaning that the PSA is now rising when you're pretty sure there's at least microscopic disease somewhere. Any detectable PSA, if it's after a prostatectomy, if it's after radiation, it's the PSA nadir plus two. So if your nadir was 0 0.4, you wouldn't call it a failure until it hit 2.4. Uh, uh, that's how you define failure after the radiation. After a prostatectomy, if the PSA, if there's any PSA at all, then you know there's still cancer, or you assume there's still cancer. Yes, somewhere. yes. You do you know or do you assume? You assume, but it's <laughs> accurate about 99.9% .9 of the time. You just don't know where. You just don't know where. That's exactly right. Well, great.